Standing Ground Against Family's Manipulative Tactics I'm a single man in my early 30s. I've got a brother who's 29, and he's already got four kids now. He had his first at 22, and the second followed a year later. Then the third two years after that. And the fourth is the most recently born a couple months ago. His wife, my sister-in-law, and I do not get along as she always likes to try and get a rise out of me by acting superior. Then turns into an extreme self-victimizing drama queen if I retaliated against her in any way. She can cry in an instant, and can put on an extremely convincing show to get sympathy from just about anyone. My parents and brother absolutely adore her, even though they know exactly how she really is and just don't care. She's very good looking, I'll give her that. But she's so awful that I could never be attracted to her. She also refuses to get any sort of job, even though she has a college degree. And my mother willingly helps with the kids all day, so their finances are entirely dependent on my brother. This also means they can't afford to live anywhere but my parents' house. And privacy is a bit of an issue with all of them, under one roof in a three-bedroom house that was built in the 60s. Growing up, my younger brother was also the obvious favorite. We're three years apart in age, but he developed a superiority complex because I was badly punished if I retaliated against his antics in any way back then. It was obvious my parents cared for him a lot more because he got the lion's share of everything unless people called them out on it, which did happen a fair bit by other members of family, which is why my parents packed us all up and moved us about 150 miles away from them. So they generally only would only see us on holidays since it was a three hour drive. My brother got physically abusive towards me on a number of occasions, flirted relentlessly with my first girlfriend to the point she broke up with me and laughed at any misfortune I had and my parents just told me to suck it up whenever I was upset about it. I only got equal treatment when my parents wanted to keep up appearances. I admit it was rather funny to see the looks on their faces whenever they had to treat me equal to my brother on birthdays and Christmas because other people were present. We had relatives that were very nosy and loved gossiping drama. So my parents did their best to hide what was really going on and threatened to take all my stuff away if I didn't keep my mouth shut. If anything, it just made my parents celebrate more when I turned 18 and moved out because it meant they no longer had to provide for me. I wasn't even done with high school yet when I moved out, but couch surfing was far better than living with them. I was low contact ever since leaving home. They didn't even show up for my high school graduation, but I really didn't care. From that point on, I would usually only see my parents and brother on holidays like the rest of the family. The start 2020 pandemic was not kind to me. I lost my job and couldn't renew the lease on my the condo because my roommate also lost his job and neither of I us could afford the place on unemployment money. It was a rented two bedroom condo that I really loved. As the lease was ending, my roommate left early to move back in with relatives and I had to sell nearly all of my stuff because I was soon going to be homeless if I didn't downsize to an extreme. I really shouldn't have rented a place that was so expensive, but I liked living the high life until that life wasn't kind to me. And I realized I should have been living somewhere far cheaper so I could have saved more money to fall back on. But I had a plan. I own a truck simply for the fact that I've always loved trucks. So I found a $1,000 camper in good shape and put it on my truck just so I could live out of it for a while. It was supposed to be temporary, but I ended up living out of it far longer than I ever thought. I originally was hoping to be able to live out of the camper at my parents' house, where my brother and his family still reside as well. But when I asked my parents to let me stay for a while, they told me they had a full house and didn't want me there. Plus, we hadn't exactly gotten along in the past decade. They said they'd only agree to let me park my camper there if I paid them basically what it'd cost to rent an apartment in my area. That was way too much just to park my camper. I was jobless and trying to save as much of my unemployment money as I could till I could find a new job. I may as well be living in an apartment with that rent price they were asking. My parents called my camper an eyesore and told me to take a hike since we couldn't come to an agreement. And sister-in-law thought it was absolutely hilarious I had to live in a camper. My brother joined her in pointing at and mocking me while calling me a homeless bum. I parked my truck camper in a store parking lot to sleep on the first night that I had nowhere else to go. I felt scared out of my mind that someone might try to break in. Suffice to say, I didn't sleep well that night. There was nowhere else I could go as any other relatives that owned houses were fairly far away. And all my friends were all apartment people. And I was pretty attached to my area as well, so I didn't want to just leave. I'd also had my mail forwarded to a friend's apartment. 
It was the only way I could still get my mail anymore. Finding a stable place to park was pretty difficult. I went looking around to try and find a job similar to my old one. It took months of living the nomadic camper life. In that time, I had to deal with a lot. Everything from beggars and drug addicts to people demanding I leave because my camper was an eyesore. At one point, someone who told me to move claimed to be with an HOA. I wasn't even parked on a street with houses. And when I questioned, what HOA? They got incredibly belligerent and threatened me. I moved my camper anyway, just to avoid the trouble. In order to have a steady supply of electricity, I learned to use a long extension cord to plug in anywhere I could to recharge my camper batteries. This meant sneaking around and plugging it into an outside outlet of a random building while parked on a street. I know that's a crummy thing to do, but I had to keep my batteries charged so my refrigerator would stay cold. I had a small solar power bank for recharging my phone, but I didn't have anything like a generator and generators are noisy and require fuel anyway. So I did what I had to do. After months of living like that, I finally managed to get a new job. I had to move to the neighboring city to find a job that didn't involve retail. I worked retail while in college and promised myself never again, though I was nearly ready to break that promise. I was still getting unemployment money, but I had no stable place to live while receiving it, and I didn't want to still be jobless when it ran out. Plus, I was bored out of my mind. I had little else to do but read, watch movies on a small portable DVD player, use my phone or laptop, and keep note of where I could park and what local public bathrooms I could use. I kind of envy that the Japanese have public bathhouses. We could really use stuff like that over here. When I finally landed a new job, I practically lived in the back lot of the building by the warehouse in old employee parking spaces. Literally no one else seemed to bother using because they were so far in the back that the area was borderline forgotten. My boss company owner actually liked this arrangement because I was willingly available to take any shift I could get, so long as I had enough sleep. He even let me take the camper off my truck and set it up in one of the spaces so I could drive around without it. Not exactly sure if this was legal, but no one bothered us about it. The entire time I lived back there, I didn't have to deal with many trespassers. There were a few, but the security guards escorted them out. I was pretty much on call almost all the time when they needed me and was working virtually every day of the week. My boss let me plug my camper into the building for power and water, and I paid a small amount of rent by working for free on Sundays when no one else was in the office but the janitor and security guard. Beyond that, I usually had to shower at a friend's apartment or at my local gym as the camper didn't have a shower in it and only a portable toilet and I didn't want to fill it because emptying it is a nasty chore. So I used other bathrooms as often as I could. I had a key to the warehouse and could go in to use the bathroom there at any hour. I was even on a first name basis with the night security guard. He's since become one of my closest friends. The camper was easy to heat in the winter with a small electric heater. Summers were not fun though. The camper didn't have AC, so I had to get a used portable air conditioner just to make it bearable. I made a lot of overtime pay and hands-on learned some new skills from other employees. Eventually, midway into this year, I landed a better position in the company as a supervisor and started making a better salary than my old job. That's when I decided I wanted a house. The scare I'd gotten from losing my condo made me realize I needed something much more stable for the long term. I looked around for something close to my work and just two miles away found a three-bedroom manufactured home on a small property but I managed to get it for $10K, less than the asking price somehow. I used nearly my entire savings for a down payment and got approved for a home loan. I finally didn't have to live in a camper anymore. There was enough space for me to back my truck in behind the house to take the camper off to set it up in the backyard. So I put it there as its own little building, just in case I want to use it again. When I was fully settled in the house, I was dumb enough to brag about it on my book of faces. My family saw the post, and that's where this shit really starts. After a few weeks, my parents and brother along with his family came to visit completely unannounced to have a tour of my home. I didn't even give them my address. So how they found out where I live, I still don't know. None of my friends have fessed up, and no prior family members visited me before that. So I wonder if they stalked me at work and followed me home or something. It really wouldn't surprise me. Once I opened the door, they practically all shoved their way in like rambunctious tourists. 
then just started making themselves at home. They all kept poking around, and sister-in-law had this creepy smirk that she was repeatedly flashing me. And it was only later that I figured out why. And it made me madder than a bull on steroids that just got stung by a hornet. My parents were constantly talking about how I've got so much extra space now, and it's too much for someone like me who has no wife or kids. Sure, not now, but maybe someday. And my brother kept remarking about how there was more space than our parents' house, and my house was closer to his job too. Red flags all around, I know. Eventually, my brother asked me to speak privately. Everyone else suddenly left the room and piled out onto the front porch. That's what finally made me realize they'd planned something. My brother, let's call him Dan for the sake of simplicity, said the house was too much for me alone, and I should let him move in with his family because his wife is pregnant with kid number four, and my house is much closer to his job. He pointed out that I already have the camper, so I could just live in that outside while they live in the main house. And I'd like to point out that Dan never once spoke of offering rent. Mind you, he's got a good job. He also started talking about how there would be changes and even curfews, and that I couldn't just walk in at any time without prior notice. If it weren't my brother, I'd think the person I was talking to had lost their mind. But Dan lost his marbles long ago thanks to our parents treating him like he was the center of the world. I tried to speak, but he kept talking over me as if I had no say in the matter. There was no way in hell I'd rent my house or parts of my house to him. Other people, maybe, just so I can pay the mortgage off more easily, but certainly not him or his nasty wife. I've heard of this exact kind of situation in videos online many times, and never once did I think I'd actually live it because I thought it so ludicrous. But my parents, brother and sister-in-law, do all fit the bill for a bunch of narcissistic entitled crazies. So I picked up my phone and set it to start recording, then just held onto it. Dan didn't even seem to care or notice that I'd done this, and just sat there with his arms waving around while talking about all the reasons of why he needed my house. Then went from saying that to acting like it was a done deal and trying to reach out his hand to shake mine. That's when I finally showed my backbone and said, hell no. And I said it loud enough that Dan stumbled backward for a second. I'd rarely ever raised my voice to him on that level because I was punished by our parents whenever I did. But this was my house, not theirs. My spine can be as shiny as it wants here. I stood up and then told him that my house was not up for grabs and acting like I'll let him move in just because they want it, won't make it happen. I bought my house for me, and it's not my fault he keeps having more kids and has to keep living with our parents because he can't afford to move out. Dan got as physically close to me as he could without actually touching me and said that I didn't deserve the house and he needed a better place for his family to live. I laughed back in his face and said that was total bullshit because I worked hard to be able to buy my house. Of course I deserved it. Dan started yelling that I have no wife or kids and I don't need all the space. So I may as well give it to him. I said, I'm not giving him anything and he never even offered to pay me rent. If I let him move in, I'd still be covering the entire mortgage on my own house without even being able to live in my own house. Then Dan told me that he shouldn't have to pay rent because his family comes first. And our parents said I was going to do this and that I will, I yelled as if their word was law or something and told Dan that they did not have the right or power to give my house to him. Then right one cue, my parents and sister-in-law barged back in through the front door and surrounded me to try and force me to agree. There was a lot of fighting, but to sum it up from this point on, I heard the line, just do it for Dan, way more times than I can remember. In the fight, I told them all they don't have a say in my life or my house, and to get out before I called the cops. Sister-in-law screamed the loudest at me about how she was pregnant again, and I can't do this to her. I said I did nothing to her. She just assumed she could take and take from me like I would just allow it. I had no obligation to her or her family. Then I called her a stuck-up bitch who never had any respect for me, so I don't care what she thinks or how many kids she has. I have no sympathy for her. She won't be living in my house. Well, that made her angry enough to attack me. She got in one good hit on my face and tried to do more, but my brother held her back kicking and screaming. She kept demanding he let her go so she could scratch my eyes out. The phone I was holding recorded pretty much everything, so I held it up and said I was going to call police if they didn't leave right away. My parents told Dan they were leaving. Then my mother said that I had a week to come to my senses. 
I told her I won't be and to not come back. Then I told sister-in-law that my phone recorded everything and if she tries anything, I'll press charges for assault. She screamed at me and then stormed out loudly crying with her face in her hands. My mother was the last one out the door and said that I better do this for Dan and sister-in-law. I responded by telling her I won't be. Part two. However, by reading this and my first post, you'll know just how messed up my parents are. As in my life, they were the root of all evil that spoiled my brother into the asshole he is today. And never once have they given me a real reason for why. And I kind of fear there isn't one. Some people can't explain why they make choices like child favoritism. So it's all they can do to try and stand by the child they backed, which is exactly what my parents tried to do. And I've practically destroyed their lives for it. Not in the legal sense, but more an emotional one. After I kicked my parents, brother and sister-in-law out for trying to force me to hand over my new house to my brother, I immediately went to my social media and told the story to the whole family. It spread pretty fast, but you won't find it now because it all got deleted some time ago and I put my own profile on private. I posted about it because I knew that the first thing my family would do when they got home is try to twist the event to make me the villain. And I was exactly right, but I had about an hour to get started before them. And I had video evidence to back up my story about what they'd done. Being preemptive worked because I got a fair number of family members on my side right away. My parents, brother and sister-in-law must have been all set to write their own post, but it was too late. So they didn't even bother trying to lie much. My parents, Dan and sister-in-law had a few flying monkeys supporting them, but not much else. Plenty of others knew how entitled they already were. So what happened was something they all quickly understood and accepted. There was one person in particular that called me. I don't know who they were, but they ranted at me that I was a horrible brother and I needed to make way for a real family man. I just ended the call and blocked the number. This didn't repeat. The week went by and my parents showed up with Dan at my front porch just like they said they would in their prior ultimatum. They rang my doorbell like crazy and also pounded on the door until I finally answered. I opened it just a crack and they tried to shove their way in again, but I'd installed a couple of latch chains that prevented it and even braced my body against the door for good measure. My father and brother demanded I let them in, but I said I was recording everything on camera and would call the police if they tried to force their way in again. My mother calmed them down and then in her most sickly sweet tone asked me if I was ready to let my brother move in. I told her and the rest of them to fuck off and never come back. My mother put on the crocodile tears and asked me why I can't just do this for Dan because he's my beloved brother. I laughed and then bluntly said, I do not love him as a brother because he treated me like shit for years and they only encouraged him to do so. They are terrible parents and he is a terrible brother. Then told them to leave or I'd be calling police ASAP. They all left surprisingly easily, apart from my mother's loud crying and the others giving me dirty looks. One could say making them leave was suspiciously easy. I thought the whole mess was over, but I guess I should have taken them more seriously because they had other stupid plans. I came home later that week on Friday evening to find a moving truck and my brother's minivan parked in my driveway. It was Dan and his family there moving stuff in. He just waved to me with a shit-eating grin when I saw him. I was furious and told him and the rest of his family to stop, but sister-in-law smugly said to me that like it or not, they were moving in. And then in the most fake way, while tilting her head and puckering her lips, she said that it was okay because my mommy allowed it and I should always listen to what my mommy tells me. I seethed with rage just hearing those words and looking at her smug bitchy face. So locked myself in my truck to call the cops right away. When they realized what I was doing, sister-in-law started pounding on my window and yelling at me to stop and that I can't do this to her because she and Dan need the house. And she cried, why can't you just do this for Dan? I responded with, fuck Dan, it's my damn house, not his. Then she threatened to key the side of my truck unless I stopped calling the police, all of which the 911 operator heard thanks to the window being slightly open. I told sister-in-law if she damaged my truck, I'd sue her and she was smart enough to retreat. When the police arrived, Dan and sister-in-law along with their kids had locked themselves in my house. I told cops what had happened as well as showing them my new driver's license that had my current address on it. Then when we went to my front door, I saw that they'd changed the lock 
And the old lock was laying on the porch with the center of it drilled out, and the drill they used was laying right next to it, with a complete Harbor Freight drill bit set. Could they have been any more stupid leaving evidence out like that? I pointed out the broken lock and drill, then gave the police a rundown on all the events that happened prior. Well, I guess Dan called our parents over at some point after I arrived home, because they showed up while I was talking to the cops. My parents immediately lied and started saying that I'd agreed to rent my house to my brother and his family. I said that was an easily provable lie one way or another. So Dan and sister-in-law finally came out of my house with some papers in hand. They both looked super smug, like they'd somehow outsmarted me. They'd actually drawn up and printed out a fake rental agreement, but my signature was not on it. There was one, but it looked nothing like my handwriting. I don't think any of them have ever actually seen my signature. So that was incredibly stupid on their part. I told my parents and Dan that was stupidly blatant fraud. And if the cops investigated, they'd easily figure that out. And I don't think going to jail and court would do them any good. It could even make Dan lose his job, which is his only means of providing for his family. I also said I would get a lawyer and sue for damages if anything of mine was lost, stolen, or broken. And I'd call CPS too for good measure. Dan went white and looked really scared when I said all that, but my mother got between us and doubled down about how I should just do this for Dan and live in the damn camper so they can finally have a family home to themselves. I yelled at her that if she thought it was such a good idea, she could do it for Dan herself and let Dan have her house to himself instead. The cops separated my mother from me and I said I wanted them all out right now or I'll press charges. I stated in a shout, about how they'd drilled out my front door lock to break in. The lease papers were obvious fakes. They badly forged my signature. And I have recorded video of sister-in-law attacking me. Those are felonies I could fuck over their lives with if I wanted. And if they didn't leave, that's exactly what I'd do. The only reason I hadn't already was for the sake of Dan's kids, so they have one chance to get the fuck out. The moment my parents heard that, I think it finally clicked that they could not force me to do it for Dan. My mother surrendered and said she'd put an end to this. Then she went over to sister-in-law and spoke with her quietly for a minute while my father spoke to Dan. Sister-in-law instantly started loudly crying and ripping up the fake rental papers into tiny bits and tossing them like confetti, only to have an officer tell them to pick up the bits of paper or he'd cite them for littering. Both of the cops at this point had the, I don't get paid enough for this, looks on their faces. Dan had to start telling his kids to load their stuff back into the moving truck. The kids were all crying, and the eldest was sobbing that he won't get his own room now. Sister-in-law and Dan gathered their kids up to try and make one last pathetic attempt to guilt me with the sad family routine. You know, where they all gather together in a sort of group hug while all facing one direction. I swear, I think they'd practiced it beforehand. All of the kids had the same pleading look with quivering mouths, Sister-in-law kept rubbing her pregnant belly and tilting her head to look like a sad puppy. And my brother just made the saddest face he possibly could and said, please don't do this. We need to be able to live here. But I didn't falter and told them to keep packing. All the kids and sister-in-law turned the crying up to 11 and Dan yelled at me, are you satisfied with yourself? You've denied us a home because you're too selfish to share and help out family. I ended up laughing like a maniac and retorting that what he was trying to do was taking, not sharing. And no amount of crying will make me let his family move in because he's no brother of mine anymore. He's just an entitled prick who thinks he can take whatever he wants from me, like when we were kids. Dan started F-bombing me until the cops told him to cool it, or he'd be in cuffs regardless if I wanted to press charges. He sucked in his lips and looked a mix of afraid and supremely pissed off. I asked the cops if they could stick around until my parents, brother and sister-in-law had all left. And they said they had no intention of going anywhere until this had been resolved. In fact, in the next few minutes, two cops became four as more drove in for whatever reason. That gave my parents some extra incentive to get moving. I made Dan give me the keys to the new lock he'd put on my front door. Though I got another lock the next day anyway, because I didn't know if he had copies of the keys or not, he was really reluctant to hand them over. Then instead of handing them to me, he actually threw them down the street and into a storm drain while saying to go get them myself. But one of the cops scolded him for that and made him go get them. He had to pull the grate off just to get at them. 
and he got pretty dirty in the process. When he got the keys back, he just grumbled, then slammed them down into my hand. I then told them all to leave and never come back. My mother said I'd be disowned for this, as if that were some kind of threat to me, and I voiced that to them. Then, in an overly sarcastically, I said something along the lines of, oh no, that means I won't get to come to any holidays with you guys, where I always get treated like shit by you all anyway, because Dan has always been your obvious favorite. You treated all me so badly when I was growing up that if Dan ever needs an organ donor, I wouldn't give him anything. So do like you always told me to do when I was mistreated by all of you and suck it up. My parents were floored after I said all of that. And the quartet of cops were looking pretty judgmental at them as well. I tell you, if you want to put nasty parents like mine on the spot, confront them in front of cops. Because they'll likely not try anything really stupid then. My mother just started crying and walking away. My father just stood there looking like he wanted to hit me. And Dan just held his kids in defeat. Oh, and sister-in-law was off having a tantrum in my front lawn. Soon enough, they all formed a line handing out boxes and got their stuff out of my house. Nothing had been unpacked yet, so it all was taken out pretty quickly. But while doing it, my mother kept saying it wasn't too late, and I could still do it for Dan several times, each time trying to bargain more and more to try to make me change my mind. She said that Dan could pay me rent if I let them stay, and when that didn't work, she said I could move back in with them to let Dan rent my house, so I wouldn't have to share the building. I told her to shut up and keep packing boxes, because I don't want Dan or his family around, I don't want his money, and I certainly don't want to live with him or my parents ever again after the way they treated me when I was a kid. Making a deal with my parents would be like making a deal with the devil to me. Sister-in-law ended up having another tantrum after hearing that and threw a box down, then sat on the ground to have a pity party because she didn't want to go back to sharing a house with my parents, and she just sat looking angry sad there until everyone else was finished. She didn't even want to get up when it was time to leave. They finally got everything out of the house and into the truck. So before they left, I laid into my parents one last time about all of the shit they put me through growing up. And with four cops being right there, they couldn't do much other than stand there and take it for once. I called them out on so many things that happened, and even pointed out how they couldn't just do something nice for me, like letting me stay over with my camper when I was homeless and trying to get back on my feet. How they let Dan and sister-in-law ridicule me and call me a bum. Well, who's the bum now? They wanted to kick me out of my own house so Dan could stay in it free of charge, yet when I needed a place to go, they wanted to gouge me for more than I could afford just to park my camper when they knew I was out of the job. There were more extremely judgmental stares from the cops when I said all of that. So I put my parents on the spot one more time and asked them what I ever did other than being born to deserve being treated so badly. Because when I finally have a bit of success in life, they want to snatch it away from me for their favorite child since they'd rather I give everything to Dan and have nothing for myself. I bought my house using the money that I earned. I owed them nothing and I won't be asking anything from them ever again because clearly I will never be anything more than a doormat or a cash cow in their eyes. Uh. I got no answers from them. They just stood there looking like fish out of water. So I continued ranting and asked them, what in God's name made them think they were such good parents after all of that? My father was beat red, but more from embarrassment than anger this time. And my mother was crying that she was a horrible person. I bluntly agreed that she is a horrible person. They all are and I bet they'll go to hell for it too. They were shitty people, and they all knew it. But if I'd called them out on all this stuff in private instead of in public, they'd just get mad at me and still act like I'm in the wrong. They just kept up the denial for so long that it became a part of who they are. My mother buried her face in my father's jacket to cry, and my father looked more defeated than I've ever seen him. Dan and his family avoided me entirely as they finished putting everything back in the moving truck. I made sure nothing of mine was stolen. Not that I'd had a chance to get much furniture yet. I was lucky to even have a couch at that time. They all got back in their vehicles, and sister-in-law just stood staring at me with malice until my brother finally got her to drive the minivan home. And as soon as they were all gone, I got back online again and spilled the beans what happened. My parents were too embarrassed to even try and defend their actions this time. And while the family was somewhat split before this incident, it was now a landslide in my favor. 
Nearly all of the family has sided with me after this incident, and those who haven't simply aren't siding with anybody. No matter how much my parents previously tried the we did it for Dan line, no one listened anymore. So any remaining familial support they had is now gone. Many in the family who I expected wouldn't side with me did. That includes the former flying monkeys, so I guess they finally had enough. Around that time, I offered to host half the family at next Christmas Eve in my new house. My parents were not invited, I wasn't blocked on my brother and sister-in-law's profiles surprisingly, and I saw sister-in-law had her fourth baby in early November. They are still living with my parents. I'm pretty sure they knew I was watching, because sister-in-law kept making passive-aggressive posts every couple of weeks or so about not having enough space while living with my parents, probably to see if she can still guilt me. And I'm sure it's driving my mother and father up the wall, because they aren't getting any peace and quiet in their old age with three rowdy obnoxious kids, a mentally unstable sister-in-law, my golden child brother, and a newborn baby in the house all at once. Perhaps they could move into a camper in their own backyard and let Dan take over their house completely. They might get some peace then. Yeah, they could do that for Dan. Part 3. For those who commented in mass to get cameras, I will when I can afford it. I'm still in financial recovery from buying a house last year. And as far as I know, good cameras need a decent computer to record to. And I don't have anything more than a three-year-old laptop that runs Windows 10. Yes, I am aware of doorbell cams. That will be the first kind I get. For those who kept saying that I should have just gotten my brother and sister-in-law arrested, that the only reason I didn't was because they are parents, their kids need them, and if Dan was arrested, he'd likely lose his job. And without that, his family has no money. And sister-in-law has an only months old baby right now. Neither of them need to end up in jail. But you don't need jail for revenge. Police can help, yes. But I got payback without filing a police report. Would I be this merciful again? More than likely not. And they know it. I decided to wait on making an account and posting until after the new year, just in case more stuff happened. And it did. As previous readers know, my sister-in-law was making passive-aggressive posts on social media that were obviously directed at me. Especially after sister-in-law had her fourth baby in November. She was posting the same repetitive nonsense over and over again. She just found semi-clever ways of rewording it, but she pretty much kept regurgitating that she was tired of living with my parents, that there isn't enough space, she needs her own house, blah blah blah. I know I sound dismissive, but live through what I have with these people, and you'd be ready to sarcastically play tiny violins in front of them too. They're just that bad. And since I waited until January to make an account, more happened just like I thought. I stated before that I'd invited half the family for a Christmas Eve party at my house, and everyone I invited all came, even though it was a fairly long drive of around three to four hours for them. But they wanted to come and show me their support. I was praised by them a lot for how hard I'd worked to get a house on my own, and that they were sorry for everything I'd went through. I was asked why I didn't just take my camper and drive the three hours back to them, instead of living pretty much homeless for so long. And I had to sheepishly admit that I was very attached to living around here, and I had my best employment opportunities in this area. My hometown doesn't have a lot of great job opportunities in my field, if any at all. And I wanted to make my own way as much as I could, an answer they overall accepted. We moved on to having a rather nice party, the best I'd been in, in years. Some relatives even brought CDs of great Christmas albums. And I have to say, the one my uncle brought of Ray Charles was my favorite. He sings Christmas songs like no one else I've heard. It was a grand and happy time. I felt like for once I could just forget my past issues and enjoy the moment. But I wouldn't be writing this if it had stayed that way. About two hours into the party, you know who showed up. My parents, brother and sister-in-law popped in trying to look all smiles. They didn't even knock just walked right in my front door like they were meant to be there. I shut off the music and told them to leave immediately. They begged to stay and said they brought gifts. One of my uncles stood up and yelled at them before I got another chance to speak. And he said they don't deserve to be in my home or my life after the shit they tried to pull months earlier. And he was backed up by several other relatives. Mind you, this guy is my mother's brother and he used to love her to pieces until he found out about the shit that went on between me and my parents. My grandparents, mother's parents, as old as they are, hurriedly got in between us and said to my parents that if they want to make amends with me, it's far too soon. 
and they've never been more disappointed in them than they were this past year. They'd hidden their favoritism for my brother from prying eyes for a long time, but no one was fooled anymore, and they needed to make a serious effort to try and actually treat me like a son if they ever wanted to be in my life again. Then they turned to Dan and sister-in-law and said they've seen the repetitive nonsense sister-in-law keeps posting about. They're tired of it and to just let it go already. My house will not become their new home. Sister-in-law went back to her old standard of crying and had a pity party about how she should be the one living here and not me. She plopped down in a chair to have a tantrum and say it wasn't fair I got this house to myself when I have no family of my own. And she has four kids that need more space. And she just wanted a better place to live in and feel like a real mom. It was petty of me, but I loudly pointed out that she sucks as a mother because she lets my mother do most of the parenting while she sits on her butt all day drinking, playing on her phone, or going out and spending all of Dan's money. And she has the nerve to complain about it. I even joked that I'm surprised her baby doesn't get drunk from her breast milk since she drinks so much booze, which I admit went a bit too far as I got some stares. And sister-in-law demanded to know if I was calling her a bad mom. I said the evidence speaks for itself. And if she wanted to be able to afford to move out of my parents' house someday, then she needs to put her college degree to some use, get a job, and learn to save money. My mother already does most of the child care for my brother's kids anyway, so she'd have plenty of time after her baby gets a little older. My brother's eldest kid, who's seven years old, ran up to start kicking and screaming at me for yelling at his mom. And he kept at me about how his mom said that I was the bad guy who made her cry and didn't let them live here. That's when my brother grabbed his son to pull him away. But all the other relatives jumped back in, and this sort of turned into a family intervention against my sister-in-law and brother. She was crying, her new baby was crying, her kids were crying. Hell, even Dan was very nearly in tears from the verbal lashing he was being assaulted with. He ended up just sitting on the ottoman. I keep shoes in by the front door and looking like a complete wreck. He couldn't look anyone in the eye. He couldn't even say two words to me. Not with a whole house filled with angry people ready to judge him if he tried to let out his inner golden child again. If they weren't there to get in his way, I'd bet this would have ended up a repeat of when he tried to order me around to try and take my house months earlier. By this point though, he'd been so thoroughly humiliated that his and my parents' reputation in the family was completely destroyed because the masks were all now off now. Soon after my parents, brother and sister-in-law all left in defeat, the party resumed and we all avoided speaking of what just happened for the rest of the evening. Since most of the adults had been drinking, everyone stayed the night in my house I even let some of them sleep in the camper so there'd be enough space. I admit, it also makes a good guest house. My relatives all wanted a tour of it earlier as well. And they said they couldn't believe I'd been living in it for around two years. I got a lot of questions about it, like what summer and winter was like, and so on. I was up earlier than everyone else Christmas morning, and had a fresh pot of coffee and some ibuprofen for those spiked eggnog hangovers a few of them had. I was complimented on being a way nicer host than my parents ever were and we all agreed to do this again next Christmas. After Christmas, sister-in-law did finally stop making posts that were obvious digs at me and deleted all of the old ones as well. But shortly after the new year, she more recently made a new post complaining about how she'd tried to convince my parents to get a camper like I did, so it could be set it up in the backyard so Dan and his family could use the whole house as their family home. Well, a taste of one's own medicine is never fun because my parents turned that idea down Vehemently, I hear. No one is going to push them out of their own home, let alone their master bedroom. The post was only up for a couple of days before sister-in-law removed it, and she has hardly posted anything since then. She loves to complain, but if a tree falls and no one is around to hear it, can it still complain? Sister-in-law, I guess, has realized there's no point in doing it when no one hears her anymore, and Dan can't afford to move his family out on his salary alone anytime soon. If they end up expecting another child in the next few years, I won't be surprised. Things mellowed down for me since then, and I've even invited friends over for a poker night. I suck at poker because I can never remember a damn thing about it. But so what? We get to drink beer and eat junk food while being merry idiots. We all loaded up on Whoppers from Burger King and just had at it the best way four grown men can when they just want to have a good unadulterated time and get pissed drunk. I think maybe around summer I'll look into possibly dating someone. I'm not exactly getting younger here, 
Fingers crossed that goes well. My camper just sits idle in my yard now. And I admit, there were some days I went out there just to spend time in it. I did live in it for two years. It's like my second home. And maybe one day I'll actually get to use it for camping. Like, it was meant to be. I've never been camping. My parents considered it a waste of time. So it'd be a completely new experience for me. This pretty much marks the end of what happened. My parents, brother and sister-in-law, have all been staying very clear of me. In fact, they seem to have gone back to acting like I don't exist, like they did before I bought a house. Not like that bothers me at all, it's better that way. But they'll inevitably come back in some way. I know they will. I just wonder what kind of stupid thing they'll do next. If anything notable like all this ever happens again, I'll make another post if this account is still active. Part four. This will not surprise some people who commented on my previous parts, because my parents did some of the exact things they said they would, which was wanting either my money or my signature. I did expect the classic lines of narcissists saying that I owed them, or give me some kind of socialist BS of sharing the wealth, but that was just my imagination running wild. The ensuing situation was somewhat similar to that, but much more tame, I guess you could say. They seemed to know not to push me too far now, and were mostly aiming for pity. It began when my parents recently got in touch with me through social media and asked for a meeting in a public place of my choosing. It just screamed trap, but I wasn't afraid. In fact, I was amused. They know I'm not to be fucked with anymore, so I could only wonder what they wanted this time. I picked a local restaurant that may have a name of an olive and a garden in it, and we met up there. Dan was with them, but he kept his mouth shut most of the time. We had awkward greetings, ordered some drinks, and then cut to the chase. My parents begged me to help Dan get his own apartment so he could finally move out. Apparently, Dan's credit isn't so great. Gee, I wonder why. Could it be his wife regularly spends him into a hole? Well, they asked that I help by either supplying some capital or by co-signing for the apartment and helping to pay the rent for it. I simply said no to both. That's when Dan spoke up in anger and yelled at me that I have so much and I don't have a family to support like he does. He needed my help and I should be sparing the money for his family since I don't have one myself. I laughed and asked where they were when I needed their help. Of that's right. They were pointing and laughing at me for being homeless. Or should we go further back to my childhood? I'd love to delve into that with plenty of ears to listen in around us. My mother grabbed my hand and begged me not to speak of any of it. My father and Dan both just looked away and said nothing. Pretty sure they wanted to say something like they used to at me, but held their tongues. I asked them if they thought I was rich or something, and their looks said it all. And when I told them I don't have that kind of money, they looked at me like deer in headlights. I broke it down about how much I'd managed to save for the down payment on my house, and the way I had to live and work in order to save that much so fast. And then, how I spent nearly all of it on the down payment of my house. I'm still in financial recovery. I did have monthly income to spare, yes, but most of it was going right into my savings. I asked Dan what his yearly salary was, and when he told me, I pointed out that it was actually a bit higher than mine. I then loosely broke things down in rough math in front of my parents on how about 70% of my income goes to my mortgage, insurance, gasoline, internet, phone, food, and other bills. And then there's maybe 30% of that left at most that I can put into savings. And I need that money saved, get back on my feet in time. And I have to make sure I have savings to fall back on. My truck is from the 90s. If it were to break down, I'd need money to either fix or replace it. And there's other things one would need a rainy day fund for, like home repairs, doctors, taxes, lawyers, or anything in general you'd need quick cash for when it's a sudden unexpected expense. So, as you can see, I just can't spare money for Dan. And I also refuse to co-sign for anything, as that would leave me on the hook for any bill Dan couldn't or wouldn't pay. Then I pointed out that that's likely why my parents didn't co-sign for Dan's apartment themselves long ago, and my mother just started crying again. I was pretty much one step ahead of them in all of this. I'm not an ATM, and I'm not a fool. And I stated that right to their faces. I expected my father to become angry with me like he always does, but this time he just, well, didn't. I've known this man to explode on me for the slightest provocation of not enabling my brother all of my life, but this time he just didn't do that. There wasn't even a sneer on his face. The only way I could describe the look he had was regret and defeat. Maybe regret for being a shitty parent. Or maybe regret because he can't bully me around anymore. Who knows? Either way, my parents couldn't really argue with me, and I wasn't about to give them any money. 
Dan just got up and said this was all just a waste of their time and that he was leaving. My mother started apologizing for him, but Dan still wanted to leave. Then just to kill with kindness, I offered to buy them a round of unlimited soup and salad while we were all there. I guess they couldn't turn down free food since we hadn't ordered anything but drinks yet, and they stayed. I went out of my way to talk about anything other than money. Dan remained quiet and was either eating his food or looking at his phone. But my parents just awkwardly talked with me. They brought up that they've recently joined a local Christian church and that they'd already been going for the last two weeks. I said, good for them. And they of course started trying to advertise that they'd like me to go too. I simply said no thanks and they were smart enough not to push further. When the meal was finished, Dan left a $10 on the table for the tip and walked off without saying another word to me or anyone. My mother just excused his behavior and we all parted ways. That was about it. Not nearly as much drama as I thought there'd be, but this is still far better than how things used to be with my parents and brother. As for sister-in-law, well, she's been regularly complaining online about my parents. She really doesn't seem to like the fact that she's not queen bee of their house and I think her toxic is finally getting to them. Why else would they be so desperate to come crawling back to me? Sister-in-law actually wants my parents to move into a camper like I had to do in order to make space in the house, and she's being told no every time. She does seem to have a following of Karen-minded people like her though, because here and there I get messaged by someone I don't know that are intent on raging at me for not giving up my house for sister-in-law. I don't bother to argue with these people anymore, I just block and move on, though there was one persistent troll who had my phone number, and they call from a different number every time. Yes, it seems to be the same person who called me to say, I need to make way for a real family man like Dan, but I could care less. The calls though, seem to have slowed down, if not maybe stopped, because I made it clear to that person that they were only amusing me by keeping this up so long. The last time they called was around the beginning of the month, and it's been silence from them since then. Part 5 Well, I figured I'd wait half a year or so after the original posts to update everyone. Yes, things did go bad again, but not really for me for the most part. I'm pretty much fine, if not almost unscathed since last Christmas, apart from the time my parents and Dan came to me for money, as my last post told, and a more recent confrontation between me and sister-in-law you will read about here. I did get a few cameras for my house, including a ring doorbell in front. I didn't tell my family about the cameras just in case, but thus far no one has attempted a break-in. I think the way I outed them all before scared them into leaving me alone, for the most part anyway. I've taken to renting out two of the rooms in my house. One to a close friend, the other to a friend of said close friend. Both have been fantastic tenants. They know to keep quiet and leave me alone most of the time and even have small refrigerators they keep in their rooms so they don't need to keep any of their drinks in the main fridge. The deal I gave them on rent was too good for them to pass up. It increased my monthly income well. And even after taxes, I'm still monthly putting away some decent amounts in the bank since the rent money pays a good chunk of my monthly mortgage. You're all probably wondering how my parents, brother and sister-in-law, took to me renting out those rooms to friends. Well, the answer is, not well. My father and Dan stayed out of it. But sister-in-law freaked out, which made my mother come crying to me over how I could have rented those rooms to Dan and his family instead. We had a bit of an argument in which I pointed out for one thing. They fucking broke into my house before to try and steal it. She wouldn't want to let someone who did that move in with her. Also, there wasn't enough room for me, Dan, and his entire family in my house. Not that I'd ever share a roof with them anyway. It's a three bedroom and a manufactured home no less. I have the master bedroom and its adjoining bathroom. That would have left only two small rooms for Dan, sister-in-law, and four kids. Not to mention they'd be annoying AF to me all the time. Also, she knows very well I can't be around sister-in-law because she intentionally antagonizes me. And they all mocked me when I was homeless before. Besides, my current tenants are both single guys in their 30s I get along with. My mother had some sobbing excuses for a while but she finally let it go and admitted she was just desperate. Since then, my parents haven't bothered me once about the house, so things are good for me. My parents and Dan, not so much. It turns out sister-in-law is a far worse person than even I thought. I already knew she was a gaslighting, self-victimizing drama queen, 
but she sank even lower because Dan's youngest child turned out not to be his. Yeah, you all read that correctly. Sister-in-law had an affair, which in retrospect isn't all that surprising. And something a few people here totally called months ago. After being caught, sister-in-law was ousted from the family. Dan just recently finished with his divorce, which actually went in his favor since we thankfully live in an at-fault state. Dan also sued to get his name taken off the birth certificate of the youngest child and won. Basically, after the incident where my parents tried to force me to hand over my house, things got pretty tumultuous over at their house. Sister-in-law blamed me a lot. She was convinced somehow that I had tons of money, like I'd won the lottery or something, and that I should share the wealth. Apparently, it was her idea that they come to my Christmas party because she hoped they could all try to get on my good side. It was also her idea to make my parents and Dan try to get money from me for an apartment. So it really burst her bubble when Dan and my parents informed her of how my finances actually were. For the longest time, she had Dan and my parents fully engulfed in her toxic mindset and only fed their narcissism with her own. So her blaming me made the rest of them blame me. That is until what happened in front of the police when they tried to steal my house. That's when the downfall for sister-in-law really started. My parents and Dan were apprehensive about coming to my Christmas party after the way I'd outed them but sister-in-law convinced them to just throw together a few cheap gifts from what they could get at the last minute and just show up because he'd never throw us out once we're already there. Boy, was she wrong. She gambled on that plan and I with the complete blessings of everyone I'd invited threw her and the rest of them out. Her plan she no doubt thought was the most clever thing ever, backfired in her face spectacularly. I guess being chewed out by family at my party not only wrecked my parents' reputation even more, it actually started a wake-up call for them to eventually not listen to sister-in-law anymore. And as I said in my last post, my parents decided on going back to church. Perhaps because last year I'd said they'd probably go to hell for their actions. I can't say that's the real reason, but you gotta admit, it would feel kinda satisfying if that was the case. Though my parents hadn't been to church in two decades before going back. While I don't think it's a bad idea that they're going to church, they need to understand that going doesn't just give them a do-over for all the shit they've done in the past. But I have a little faith they're at least trying, because my parents came to my house without Dan to personally apologize to me after they'd seen an animated video if my first three posts. That's right, they've known about this Reddit account for a long time now. They also know everything I'm saying. Yes, they're unhappy about it. But I feel everyone here deserves an update since it's anonymous. For my parents and Dan though, Watching an animated video of themselves and their own actions was a great way to make them see what kind of people they really are. And they came over to apologize to me later. I'd never seen my father apologize like that to anyone. And the man isn't a good actor. So this felt genuine. They fully acknowledged what they did to me and how there's no excuse for any of it. They even described themselves as narcissists and admitted the truth that they had wronged me very badly. Then they went on to blame sister-in-law for a lot of things. Yeah, they kind of threw her under the bus, but it's not like she wasn't guilty of everything they said. My parents have been getting counseling for a while now too, and did offer group family counseling, but I declined as I'm not ready for that anytime soon. Dan himself didn't apologize to me for some time, but he looked extremely remorseful anytime the past was brought up. Meanwhile, Dan and sister-in-law's marriage absolutely fell apart. It wasn't a crumble, it was a cascade. Without me, as the scapegoat slash black sheep slash ATM, that they couldn't mock or try to get money from anymore. And after the public humiliation of social media, my Reddit posts, and the animated online video, sister-in-law finally let out enough of her toxic on Dan and my parents for them to realize she's not the person they thought she was. Their denial had been strong, but sister-in-law's entitlement was stronger. I've had many a thought of lightsabers clashing over this drama. Sister-in-law clad like a bimbo Sith with a lightsaber that looks like a giant lipstick, or something like that. I imagine there's a wealth of puns and jokes to be had there, but I really didn't bother to think much more detail about it. But as you can imagine, things only got worse because sister-in-law kept looking for other ways to get what she wanted. She kept bringing up ads for used campers and RVs to try and get my parents to buy one to live out of, so they could have the main house. And she kept doing this no matter how many times they told her to stop. She even tried to say my parents should just buy an RV and have a life on the road, like normal old people do. That was stupid, even for sister-in-law. 
The opposite was suggested by my parents that Dan and sister-in-law buy a camper themselves to live out of it instead. Sister-in-law basically said she shouldn't have to do that since she's the mom. She pretty much lorded the fact that she thought she had total parental authority over everyone's heads because the kids in the house were all hers. And when sister-in-law didn't get her way, she actually took her baby and left the house to disappear for several days. They knew she was fine because her phone was still working, and she was responding texts with short but passive-aggressive answers. And when she came back, she was only more embittered because nobody caved to her demands while she was away. Sister-in-law also refused to go to church. But Dan went with our parents and took his kids along as well, save for the youngest, since sister-in-law refused to let him take the baby anywhere. Personally, I don't go to church. I believe in God and all that stuff. But I just don't like church. Besides, it never did me any good growing up. Part 6. Just so everyone understands, a lot of this information came from Dan and my parents. So I'm just telling what I know. Shit really hit the fan when Dan suddenly called out his wife as a cheater March. This shocked us all because we thought he was a complete pushover to her. But no, he's not. At least not anymore. You all know how he treated me when I was on his bad side? Well, his wife wasn't spared that ire at all. He started putting pieces together about her deceit after finally pulling his head out of his ass and secretly got DNA tests for all his kids. Three of the kids are his, but the youngest one, the baby was not. For the record, Dan and I both have pretty dark straight hair that's almost black, same with our parents. Sister-in-law's hair is straight and pretty dark too, but the baby's hair is lighter and a bit curly. At first, Dan just thought it was because of the baby's age. Sister-in-law kept playing it off and said that it would darken in time, but the baby's hair never got darker. I guess that was Dan's biggest clue. He confronted his wife with the DNA results in front of our parents and she broke down sobbing that it was a mistake. Sister-in-law pulled out all the Darvo stops of denying, trickle-truthing, and gaslighting. But Dan had none of it, and actually had done more to find out about her affair than I would have ever thought. I knew he was smart. He just let himself be dumb. He had detailed proof of her cheating with phone records, texts he got off her phone, bank records, and the DNA test. He even identified the man she's cheating with who is likely the father since he has much lighter colored curly hair. The evidence against her was crystal clear, and Dan said she was so bad at hiding her affair, he didn't even have a hard time figuring any of it out once he started looking. My parents demanded that sister-in-law leave their house immediately. That's when she went psycho on them all, first in just yelling, but she quickly got physical. Police had to be called by my mother, and yeah, sister-in-law was arrested. She scratched up Dan and my father quite a bit with her long, fake nails, and even harmed her eldest kid in the crossfire by hitting him hard enough to have a black eye and nosebleed when he tried to intervene. Dan was smart enough to have his phone recording nearby when he confronted her, so the police had all they needed to arrest her for assault. Sister-in-law's parents had to drive over to bail her out. Then they came back for the baby, sister-in-law's stuff, and her car as well. A couple days after sister-in-law got bailed out, she showed up at my house because I was apparently next on her shit list. As soon as I opened the door, she went on a delusional rant where she called me out about posting on Reddit, then said I was the entitled bane of her existence. I'm not sure, but I think she might have been high on something, because this felt extra crazy for her, and her eyes didn't look right. She claimed mothers with young children are the most sacred thing in the world then went on yelling that giving up my house shouldn't have been too much to ask for, because supporting the family was the least I could have done, and if I had, then her family would still be together. When I tried to talk while she was spewing all that out, she actually attempted to shove me and cover my mouth. She even had her hand poised like she was ready to scratch me. Well, that went about as well with me as you can expect. I'm not exactly one to be threatened, and told her I'd call police if she didn't take her hands off me right that moment. I also told her I'd got all it on my doorbell camera. She started panicking the moment she heard camera. Then I ended up verbally savaging her to the point she was backing off my porch. I told her she had some gall to call me, entitled when she's exactly that. She didn't work for anything she had anymore, cheated on her husband and got pregnant from her affair partner, made my mother do most of the parenting for her children, spent Dan's money till they were in a financial hole, and acted entitled to my home to the point of trying to steal it. I called her entitled X1000. 
and that she's a greedy bitch who is blinded by narcissism. Then I told her to stop blaming me for her own actions, and to never show up at my house again. Being told all that was pretty much all sister-in-law needed to hear before jumping back into her car, then peeled out and sped off. This was finally the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Now that she was separated from Dan, I ended up finally going to the police and filing a report on her for harassment and the assault she'd done on me last year. And her putting her hands on me at my front porch only added to it. The police have it all on record now. And I gave copies of the video to Dan for his divorce lawyer. And yes, I did file for a restraining order against sister-in-law. It was easily granted because it was obvious the woman is unhinged. She's not made a social media post about me since that I could see. But that's just because she put her profile on private. I hope her blameship against me has long since sailed. Either way, she's left me alone. Sister-in-law was still with her affair partner during the divorce. At the time, I had no real idea of what kind of man he is. But any person who monkeys with someone else's spouse and even has a child with them really doesn't have a lot of morals to begin with. Once the, the divorce was underway, sister-in-law admitted that Dan just wasn't man enough for her anymore because he couldn't afford to give her the lifestyle she wanted. She actually believed herself to be on the level of a trophy wife and that she deserves to be with someone wealthy. Dan said he pulled a me and maniacally laughed at her. He said she was nowhere near hot enough to be a trophy wife, along with mentioning any other faults she had. Sister-in-law ended up humiliated by this and ran off like a child. Due to having to live with her parents, sister-in-law was forced to work in their family business because Dan wasn't giving her access to his bank accounts anymore. She'd already maxed out all the credit cards he previously gave her. And she griped about having to work for her parents despite having a college degree. But I think they were the only ones who'd employ her anyway, since she's got a criminal record and a decade-long gap in her resume. I've heard from Dan that her parents were severely disappointed in her as well. But that was just a rumor. They could be just as bad as her for all I know. Either way, the shit show of a divorce really took off once it got going. Sister-in-law didn't walk away with much from it. Especially because she had an affair, physically hurt her FIL, husband and eldest child, and it's an at-fault state, like I mentioned earlier. So she kissed any chance of getting her way goodbye. Part 7. Dan's lawyer pulled some strings to get the divorce started as fast as possible, but it cost him. I don't know the more specific details or how much it all cost. They never told me. Sister-in-law, on the other hand, was financially backed into a corner very badly. And you know what can happen when you corner an animal. She fought back. But the law was not on her side, nor was her dwindling finances. Sister-in-law's parents had to pay for a lawyer for her. And not a very good one either. Also, she actually brought her affair partner to the divorce court to testify on her behalf. This guy was a real piece of work. He had a bronze tongue and a charming smile he tried to use to his advantage. He claimed sister-in-law had been wronged by an incompetent husband, which is why she sought the arms of another man. He claimed he was ready to take responsibility for his child he had fathered with sister-in-law. But that sister-in-law would still be needing the alimony for helping support herself and care for said child. He remarked that because Dan at the time was still on the birth certificate, alimony should be one of his obligations. Dan said this guy used big words and a charming smile, but seemed an extra special kind of stupid. And coming from Dan, that's saying something. The judge was also not swayed in the slightest, and told the bronze-tongued lout that he was a hypocrite for saying he was ready to take responsibility for his own child while also holding his hand out for money from the man whose marriage he'd helped ruin. That shut him up. Dan was prepared to sue his wife's affair partner for alienation of affection too. However, that fell through. I guess it would have been on Dan to prove how much she'd loved him before the affair started. But after her mask came off and we saw the real her, we're not sure if she ever really loved him at all or if she just loved having a meal ticket. Someone here pointed out sister-in-law probably kept popping out kids to avoid getting a job. And you may have been right. Either way, sister-in-law tried dragging out the divorce. But Dan's lawyer and the judge kept that from happening much. I swear, Dan must have seriously lucked out because he got one of the meanest and most unsympathetic to cheaters judges in the state. And all the evidence we had on sister-in-law made it easy to keep her from playing the victim. So instead, she just let her real bitchy self out since there was no point in hiding it anymore. 
The court had all of the records provided by Dan and myself, police reports, photos and recordings to prove she was an abusive narcissist. There was a mountain against sister-in-law that she had no way to climb over or hike around. She tried standing against the mountain, but that was prime avalanche territory. In the end of the divorce, sister-in-law struck a deal to end things quick. Dan takes three quarters of the credit card debt, gets his name off the affair baby's birth certificate, and sister-in-law walked away with only partial custody of her children, no alimony, but also without most of the credit debts she racked up. Her being legally employed by her parents meant she had an income of her own to fall back on to start paying off her debts. She can see her other kids almost whenever she wants, and can take them on weekends, but for whatever reason has made very few attempts to even see them. She took them out to eat fast food a few times, but she never took them home with her. The kids are back in school now, so that gives her even less opportunities to see them. You'd think her parents would want to see their grandchildren, but they haven't contacted Dan about it. They barely saw Dan's children before that too. Now they may not even bother to see them at all. Do they hate kids or something? Even Dan doesn't know. But he tells me that his in-laws were always indifferent to him. As for Dan, well, he really did love his wife a lot. So the betrayal of her cheating made him hit the bottle hard. Rewind back to the, the night of his confrontation with his wife. He came to me in a stupor with a whiskey bottle in hand and his face all scratched up and covered in bandages. I wouldn't say he was drunk yet, but I freaked out seeing him looking like that at first, then berated him for driving under the influence. But that didn't really mean much to him compared to the betrayal of his cheating harlot of a soon-to-be ex-wife. We spent a few hours hanging out in my camper so as not to disturb my tenants. All the while Dan was drinking whiskey straight from the bottle and crying that he's a fool, and how he regretted ever marrying sister-in-law. Pretty much any time he mentions her now, he just refers to her as that bitch. So that's ex-sister-in-law's nickname now. Ironically, this time together was the most bonding Dan and I have done in 15 years. While he didn't exactly apologize to me, he called himself a shitty human being with terrible taste in women. Then said, I at least didn't make his mistakes. Despite all he previously did to me, he's still my younger brother. And I couldn't risk letting him try to drive home. So I told him to stay the night and managed to take his keys. Then set up the bunk in my camper for him to use. I rented out my spare rooms after all. He was in no shape to drive home. And if he'd taken an Uber, he'd have to pay for it and then have to come back for his car later. He was still a depressed crying mess and didn't want our parents or his kids to see him like that. And frankly, I was worried he'd do something insanely stupid if I let him leave. I didn't want him to sleep in the house, so putting him in the camper was the best option. Just because that bitch fucked him over doesn't mean I suddenly trusted him. So better for him to sleep it off in the camper. We both spent time in the camper playing games and watching movies on my portable DVD player. Poker was no fun with just two people and Old Maid was just boring. Thankfully, I had an Uno deck too and an old school battleship game. He really liked those. It was enough to keep him distracted until he was finally willing to lay down after running out of whiskey. He threw up a lot of it in a bucket anyway, but he was not opposed to sleeping in my camper. In fact, he found the idea kinda cool. Dan had a lot of questions for me as to how I'd lived in the camper for as long as I did, and I answered them all, if not just to keep him busy, but I needed to go to bed myself since I had to be up early. So I left him with my portable DVD player and a couple of movies. That way, he could amuse himself alone for a while, if he even managed to stay awake. Before leaving for work in the morning, I popped in while Dan was passed out in the bunk and left a bottle of ibuprofen and an energy drink on the counter of the camper's kitchenette, along with his car keys and a letter explaining to leave through the backyard gate. He saw himself out without trouble around 1.30 p.m. About a month after ex-sister-in-law, AKA that bitch, was kicked out, Dan came to me asking to borrow my camper. I guess he found it more comfortable than I'd thought when he slept in it. And he fully admitted he didn't ask sooner out of pride. But with his soon-to-be ex-wife out of the house, he'd decided to give up his room for his eldest kid. He's got two girls and a boy, with the boy being the eldest and now eight years old. The kids were all forced to share a room until that point. They just had curtains up for the boy's half of the room, but the boy often slept on the couch to avoid his sisters. I know the poor kid was really desperate for his own room, so I guess Dan decided to finally make a better decision as a dad and came to see me in order to beg to borrow my camper so his son could have his room. If he could have afforded it, 
he'd have bought his own camper instead of relying on me, and even said as much. I hadn't even gotten the chance to use the camper for actual camping yet, but I caved and let him use it since it was actually for a good cause, and he promised to buy his own in time anyway. No, I didn't ask for rent money for the camper. Dan is in enough of a financial hole as it is right now. Ex-sister-in-law and the divorce drained him, and I've learned that I get far better results with family lately by not being spiteful. I loaded my camper up and put it down in my parents' backyard, and my father put in a 30-amp breaker so it'll have enough power for Dan to run heat and AC when he needs it. I do miss the camper. After all that time living in it, it kind of felt like it was a part of me. But the only reason I loaned it out was for the sake of Dan's kids. Pretty much the only reason I still do anything for my parents or Dan is for the sake of those kids, as I've bonded with them. And yes, I know I may not get the camper back for quite some time, and likely not in the kind of condition I lent it out in, but I've warned Dan and my parents that they will be financially responsible for any damage they do to the camper, as well as its upkeep for as long as they have it. I also took many time-stamped pictures and video of the camper, inside and outside, before lending it out, so I can prove its condition before it left. Dan even recorded a video with me agreeing to my terms, so that's as good as a contract. With the financial drain of the divorce, Dan's not going to be able to get a place of his own for years, I'll bet. Though he seems to have no complaints about living in the camper, at least. But I don't know if he actually likes it, or if he's just putting up a front. But I can guess it reminds him of the backyard forts we had as kids, since that's how it felt with me sometimes. Either way, he's living in it now. I did get some major props from the extended family for letting him borrow it too. I'm now referred to by a lot of them as the good brother Dan doesn't deserve. Either way, I think getting rid of sister-in-law was a great first step in mending the family as a whole. I still have little care for my brother and parents after the way they treated me all my life, but I'm not gonna let Dan's kids suffer for it. Those kids have actually really warmed up to me. They're actually happy to see me when I come over or when they visit me. I've even babysat a few times. Now that they don't have their mothers toxic around, they've become much nicer kids, especially to me. I'm actually getting to enjoy being an uncle now. My mother is still doing the bulk of the parenting for my nibblings, and she's been acting as nice as possible to stay on my good side. My father often looks very defeated in my presence, but otherwise he's been either stoically quiet or just generally nice to me. But he won't talk to me much, though that's leagues better than how he was before at least. I'm not letting my guard down either way. My parents do seem more happy that my ex-sister-in-law is gone, and they often say they don't know what they ever saw in her. My mother especially, because the two of them butted heads over who was mom in the house for a long time. Now for the last part. At the same time as the divorce, Dan sued to have his name removed from the birth certificate of the baby that wasn't his. That bitch didn't really want to change it because it meant no more child support from Dan if she did. However, there was a court-ordered paternity test for the man identified as the baby's father. I was prepared to laugh in case it turned out he wasn't the father either, but he was. And Dan's lawyer had a long talk with ex-sister-in-law's lawyer. Ex-sister-in-law had no leg to stand on, and Dan was ready to go to bat to make her situation even worse. She didn't have the finances to fight him any longer, and agreed to changing the birth certificate. The bronze-tongued lout who'd knocked her up did man up to take financial responsibility as a parent. But he ended up not staying with sister-in-law. He contacted Dan through his lawyer to tell him he'd broken up with that bitch and that he wouldn't bother him again. I checked the social media of that guy after Dan linked me to it, and the lout was upset that now he's financially responsible for a child he never planned to have and that he's too young for this. Guys, from what Dan's lawyer was able to find out, that man is just over 40. He looks younger than he is, but he's by no means a young man. Shortly after that, he put his online profile on private. Ex-sister-in-law did the same with hers a long time prior, so I've no more information left to give. This may be the end. Ex-sister-in-law is out of our hair. My parents and brother have finally made a real effort to be better people. I'm surprisingly happy as an uncle, and my house is still my house. Part eight. No surprise, ex-sister-in-law saw my posts. She can't contact me about them in any way, but with a lawyer thanks to my restraining order against her. And she likely can't afford to get a lawyer right now anyway, 
Since the divorce financially drained her too, so she bitched to Dan about it and demanded he tell me to delete my Reddit account. But not only has Dan read my recent posts, he no longer cares. He said they serve as a reminder of the prick he used to be, and he's not losing sleep about it. Besides, I've still helped him out despite all he's done to me, so he he's not gonna be upset about it. My parents have also made sure to try and treat Dan and I more equally when I'm around too. My father is still a man of few words around me though. Someone pointed out that changing now after so long of treating me as the opposite of Dan means he doesn't know how to connect with me anymore. And I think they're right. I don't mind the way he is now though. My mother has also developed a habit of saying she's sorry about every little thing in my presence. Dan told me that she and my father have been reamed a lot by extended family and their counselor, and now my mother feels like she needs to apologize for everything. This is all a stark contrast to how they used to treat me. Also, I didn't talk about before what ex-sister-in-law's opinion was on Dan borrowing my camper so his son could have his and ex-sister-in-law's old bedroom. Well, like a stereotypical bully, she looked down on him and mocked him about it because now he's living like a bum, as she put it. But Dan took it all in stride and asked if she was done yet because he knew this was exactly how she'd react. And he just plain doesn't care anymore. She's borderline dead to him and her insults were on deaf ears. Then he pointed out to her that he was living out of the camper because he was putting his kids ahead of himself so his son could have his own room. Something his ex never did, despite being their mother. She just weaponized her children and pregnancy to keep from working and to emotionally blackmail everyone. Then he asked her to remind him how that was working out for her. Mind you, this was early on in their divorce. I'm sure you can all guess her reaction. Dan said his ex did have quite the tantrum about my recent posts, but no one has bothered to contact me on her behalf to take them down. So she just has to live with the well-deserved shame. She has been trying to act nicer to Dan lately. Guess the grass isn't so green living with her parents? Dan tolerates her as the mother of his children whenever they meet, but nothing more. He will never take her back. He's told me that he can never look at her like he used to, and the very thought of her turns him off emotionally. So ex-sister-in-law pretty much has no chance of reconciliation. I have no new info on ex-sister-in-law's affair partner. His social media is still locked down, same with ex-sister-in-law's, and it's likely to remain that way as long as I have a chance of reading them.